pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Alan Downs. Uh, Alan is a, a PhD uh, California licensed clinical psychologist and the author, author of The Velvet Rage, Overcoming the Pain of Growing Up Gay in a Straight Man's World. Uh, Alan is the uh, former CEO of Michael's House, a drug and alcohol treatment center in Palm Springs. He specializes in GLBT issues, dialectical behavioral therapy, and psychological assessment. He is currently in private practice in Los Angeles, where he sees individuals and conducts workshops. His 20 years of working in mental health and substance abuse are reflected in his eight books, both leadership and self-help. Dr. Downs is the author of the 1996 best-selling book, Beyond the Looking Glass, and his current book, The Velvet Rage, has been the best-selling book among gay and lesbian readers for the past four years. He has been, working, he has been published in over 12 languages. Uh, Alan, welcome this, this morning, and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here um, with Freedom Institute. I want you all to picture uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, back in uh, the late 90s, early 2000. There's a coffee house, any of you that have been to Santa Fe may know it, called the Downtown Subscription. And I, it was a Saturday, I was sitting outside on the patio. There's a beautiful kind of a, adobe wall, the chemises around it. It's, it's a really popular spot in Santa Fe. Some of you are nodding, you see, you've seen it before. Um, and I met a gentleman by the name of Gordon, and he happened to mention something about Freedom Institute. And as I learned later, Gordon is the son of Mona who founded Freedom Institute, and that was my first real contact. So it's really interesting and wonderful that I get to be here today to share this uh, day with you and to share some important information with you that's really close to my heart, my life, and my practice. Before I begin, I would like to ask, kind of get to know the room here. So how many of you are practicing therapists that are here? Okay, great. How many of you are here associated with uh, an addiction treatment center? Okay, great. Did I miss anyone, any category that I m missed? Did I catch everyone? Are we in both of those categories for the most part? Okay, good. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is shame-based trauma. And this comes out of my own life, it comes out of my work, um, it comes out of my own frustration as a therapist. And why I say that is because what I discovered many years ago, particularly with the dawn of managed care, is that many of the folks coming in for treatment didn't necessarily fit the criteria in the DSM clearly for a diagnostic category they would maybe have some access to traits. You might call it an adjustment disorder. You knew there was some trauma, but it wasn't necessarily PTSD, and they didn't meet the full criteria for it. And they were definitely in pain, and they were seeking psychotherapy. And most of you who are practicing therapists, you know that many of the people that come in our offices fit this criteria. Many of the people coming into treatment centers who are struggling with addiction, aside from the addiction, are struggling with these same issues that don't necessarily fit a clearly defined diagnostic category. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today is about shame-based trauma. It's a category that does not currently appear in the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, which is the manual we use to di diagnose in mental health, but is a very real and, and very present uh, difficulty. And my understanding is in the next DSM, there will be a category that includes shame-based trauma for diagnosis. When I wrote The Velvet Rage, I wanted to cut to the core of what it's like to live with a secret, a secret that makes you believe that you're fundamentally unlovable. And that, that came out of my experience as a gay man, as a therapist that works with a lot of gay men. Uh, when you grow up with the secret of your own sexuality, when you know that if you were to reveal that to others that you would be rejected, that they might not approve of you, that they might not love you. Um, and, and then long after you come out of the closet and you become comfortable with that, there's this ingrained, hardcore belief that there's something about me that is fundamentally flawed and that I somehow need to compensate for that. Now, years later, I began working in a dialectical behavior therapy group and, I, and as many of you know, DBT, or Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and I'll refer to it often as DBT um, throughout this morning, 
is, is designed primarily to treat borderline personality disorder. Now, borderline personality disorder, um, for many of us in the room, is almost like a, a dirty word. As a therapist, when they don't respond to your wonderful treatment and all of your expertise, what do you say? Well, borderline. they're borderline, right? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a throwaway category. But it is a very real and pervasive disorder, we all know that. And as I began working with many of the folks that were coming into a DBT program, many of which um, do fit the full criteria for personality disorder, and many which do not but have certain traits, I found that they had the same experience that I did. They weren't necessarily gay. They had grown up with a secret. And as they had lived with that secret, they became convinced that there was, deep down inside them, there was something that made them unlovable. And the impact that that had on their life was absolutely profound. So today, that's what we're going to talk about with shame-based trauma. Let me, let me talk with you about a couple of the questions that come up with, for many of our clients. How do I find a lasting sense of purpose in my life? Why am I never really satisfied? When will I finally be content with my accomplishments? Why do I eventually get dissatisfied with most all of my relationships? How do I find the courage to be my own person? Why am I so sensitive to criticism? Will I ever find lasting joy and passion? There's currently no diagnostic category that clearly captures the essence of this, and yet all of us in this room know that most of the folks coming in for treatment are struggling with these very issues. They may be associated with depression, they may be associated with PTSD, they may be associated with a personality disorder, but those don't clearly capture what's happening here. Instead, what we see is chronic dissatisfaction, a lack of meaning and purpose and direction, and hypersensitivity to invalidation. These are some of the characteristics of shame-based trauma an inability to maintain lasting and fulfilling relationships. All right, so let me take you back. Most of, most of you know this, but I want to take you back really to what I'm going to call um, Psych 101. We need to get a little bit of an understanding about basic emotions. Um, there's been a lot that's been written about emotions. Many of you know that in the room, but it's good to review it because it will set the stage for how we're going to talk about shame and the impact that shame has on our life. First of all, what we know about most of the research is that there really are just five basic emotions. Now, that may sound odd, but because we all know there's a real range of feelings and the, the, the landscape of our emotional experience is really wonderful and complicated, but when you cut it down to its basic building blocks, what we find is that there really are five basic building blocks of emotion. All of the other emotional experiences that we have tend to be emotions coupled with thoughts or emotions that are coupled with each other that create that complexity. So the five that we know clearly are anger, sadness, joy, fear, and shame. Now there's some interesting things about these five um, that, that we'll talk about, but what what we understand about these emotions is that these are the ones that clearly there is a physiological change in your body when you experience these emotions. For anything else, it's not clearly uh, different from, uh, from one of these states. For example, if we talk about frustration and we talk about anger, we can't identify necessarily when you're experiencing that a difference in your body between those two emotions. So what the difference is between, let's say, anger and frustration, it's the same basic bodily response coupled with thoughts around interpretations, if you will, around what that experience or that feeling is. So what, the reason why we're angry is we're not getting what we want or um, something's blocking us, so we decide that we're frustrated but the underlying emotion is anger. We could go through each one of these and do the same thing. Sadness is the same, um, as well as joy, fear, and shame. Now, what is the emotion that we all talk about that's, that doesn't, isn't appearing here? Someone, anyone? Love, love. Love, exactly. That's what's really profound, and if you really get this, it will actually change your life, and it changes a lot of your work with your clients. Love is not a basic emotion. Love is actually joy that's experienced in the presence of another person or another thing over time. Coupled with 
a lot of thoughts about commitment. There may be sexual attraction that's part of it. It's, it's a much more complex emotion. But at the core of love, we find joy. Now, why is that important to us? Because there is, of all of these emotions, you notice how many of them are positive? Only joy. Only joy. There's only one. And there are four that are negative. So what that tells us is that for, as humans, uh, in our emotional feeling, we are predisposed really toward the negative. And our emotional system is really designed to be a warning system. It's like, it's like the, the red lights on your dashboard, you know? What they, they used to call them the idiot lights, I guess. Now we've got computers on, on cars and it's not quite like that. But when something would go wrong, you'd get a light that would come up, that, that engine light that's sort of horrific on a, on a dashboard that comes on and means you're about to blow it up. That's what, that's what a, the emotional system really in biology is about. It's about warning you that you need to pay attention. You need to do something differently. So to understand that, um, Let's take a look at the emotions, our emotions as a guidance system. Think about anger. When you're angry, what is the urge that you have? What do you want to do? What's that? Some... Fight. You want to strike out. You want to say something. You want to do something aggressive. Kill the other one. It's an urge. The, emotions, the emotion of anger has an action urge associated with it. In fact, all of the five emotions have action urges associated with them. And the action urge associated with anger is to strike out or to attack, either verbally or physically. So it is the design of anger is when we feel it, nature, um, biology, our higher power gave us this emotion as a warning to strike out, to do something in our environment that would make a difference. Sadness, it's often to deactivate or to seek comfort. And if you think about anyone who struggled with the emotion of sadness, as in depression, recurring sadness over and over again, what happens to them? They go away, they stay in their room, they don't get out of bed, they isolate, right? And when you felt sad, you may have done the same things, coupled with seeking comfort or safety in a place with relationships or people that you know. The action urge with sadness is to seek that. And so when we feel it, we are urged, there's an urge within us to reach out and to do that, to seek that particular, um, to, to follow that particular action. And with joy, it is to activate. So it is to do something. When, whenever you go to a wedding, um, whenever you go to, to, a, to uh, a celebration, what is one thing that always happens there? What? Dancing, exactly. It's a great illustration of this. When you feel joy, well, the first thing we want to do is get up and do something. And we tend to want to do more of it. So the, the, the action urge with joy is really to activate. It's the opposite of sadness, which is really kind of a profound finding that's, that's having a lot of effect on the treatment of depression these days with activation therapy. But it is to reach out and to do more of it and to, and to engage with others. The action urge with fear, we all know that, that usually is flight. It's sometimes described as flight or fight, but that becomes really more of a complex mere, uh, mix of fear and anger. And then we look for the action urge of shame, which is to hide. All of this is to bring us to this point because I want you to understand that when we feel shame, the urge that we have within us is to hide. And there are many, many ways in which we can hide.